Tokyo, capital of the Japanese Empire and one of the three largest cities in the world, is also the surprise city of the Orient, for it has the unique distinction of having assimilated the exterior forms of a Western metropolis without having sacrificed its Oriental modes of thought and feeling. As we gaze upon this American-like metropolis, we recall the story of Perry, the American Commodore, who graciously knocked upon the gates of Tokyo and aroused Japan from its oriental slumber. That was only a few generations ago when Tokyo was a modest little Japanese town with no apparent aspirations to compete with the great commercial marts of the world. But behold what a little time has done and consider what a little more time may do for Tokyo as it is now one of the fastest growing cities in the world with a population of about six million inhabitants. To those of us who may have visualized Tokyo as it has often been visualized in Western operettas and plays, this is perhaps a disillusioning revelation, for we know sections of cities in our own country that are as oriental in outward appearance, at least, as Tokyo. Nevertheless, in spite of what we see here, Tokyo is inwardly oriental. Her people may have surrounded themselves with Western architecture, Western machinery, and all the other foreign trappings, but fundamentally, they are still loyal to the ancient traditions of old Nippon, and the undying philosophy of the East is still the chief inspiration for their thoughts and deeds. On September 1st, 1923, occurred the worst disaster in the history of Japan, the earthquake and fire which caused so much destruction in Tokyo that a great number of its buildings had to be rebuilt. And this may account somewhat for the many new and imposing edifices that may be seen all over Tokyo today. Behind all this great modern show, however, there is still to be seen in the heart of Tokyo a picturesque little replica of old Nippon, the ancient moat which surrounds the imperial palace and Tokyo residence of his imperial majesty, the emperor of Japan, who is said to be a direct descendant of the sun goddess and the 124th emperor in deity by order of birth and succession, thereby making him the oldest living member of a ruling dynasty in the history of mankind. The palace itself is approached by a double bridge over which none but members of the royal family and the most elite may cross. Among the important buildings that escaped the horrible catastrophe of 1923 is the Imperial Hotel, designed by an American architect and subsidized by the Imperial family, one of the most celebrated hostelries in the Orient. It was completed during the tragic year of the earthquake and time to provide shelter for many of the victims as well as temporary headquarters for the foreign negations that had been destroyed. The fundamental purpose of this world-famous hotel is to provide a social center for Tokyo and a general meeting place for the long lanes of travel that converge here from all parts of the world. Theater Street is a colorful illustration of Japan's great love for theatrical entertainment. There are almost 2,000 motion picture theaters in the country and Tokyo boasts of having a vast majority of the best. Japanese signs are interesting even to eyes that cannot decipher them, and they certainly provide a colorful medium for theatrical advertising. The Japanese have become motion picture enthusiasts, and in addition to importing a great number of foreign films, they produce many of their own. It is said that the influence of Hollywood's films is keenly felt by the rising generation and not a few of their radical Western ideas owe their origin to foreign motion pictures. One of the most popular of the ancient sports of Japan is Jiu-Jitsu, or Judo, the manly art of self-defense, which is characteristically Japanese. The purpose of this scientific sport is to make your opponent use his own strength to defeat himself. In other words, the force with which he thrusts himself upon you is used to turn the tables against him. Excessive weight and strength, therefore, may be more of a handicap than a help as compared to speed and dexterity. At present, jiu-jitsu is taught in most of the schools of Japan for its value in mental and physical culture, and many of the schools have teams which have seasonal clashes of national importance. 
Incidentally, the red and white color combination is consistently used as a background for sporting events all over Japan. Every year on March 3rd, the day is set aside for the little girls of Japan to observe as Dolls Festival Day. And on this occasion, dolls that have been in the family for generations are brought out to be honored and caressed with childlike affection. The Japanese doll is not simply a plaything, but a means of teaching a girl to be a good wife and mother. A doll which is preserved for a great many years in one family and is loved and played with by generations of children seems to acquire a soul. In fact, one little girl said of her doll, if you love it enough, it will live. In addition to the dolls, miniature household effects are placed on display before elaborately costumed effigies of the emperor and the empress of Japan. And at the end of this perfect day, all of the ancestral dolls are carefully put away again for another year, and the little doll-like daughters of Nippon must console themselves with their ordinary everyday dolls until the next great doll festival day. The boys, too, have a day of their own, May 5th, and it is heralded by the flying of carp kites, colorful symbols of courage, over the homes in which the boys assemble to honor the deeds of their ancestors, as well as the national heroes of their country. Unlike the girls, the sons of Nippon have unanimously adopted Western dress, and this fact illustrates again the characteristic tendency of the Japanese to mingle modernity with antiquity as on this occasion when they honor their ancient heroes, chief of whom is Jimmu Tenu, the first emperor of their country. And here is Tori Masa, the famous warrior knight and the greatest archer of his time. The powerful knight of virtue overcoming vice symbolizes one of the first principles in the education of every Japanese schoolboy. And so it is that hero and ancestor worship is ingrained in the minds of Japanese boys, and not the least of those in their list of heroes are the ancient mariners of Nippon, who went down to the sea in ships, not unlike those that still ply their trade in the harbors of Tokyo and Yokohama. And even here, that strange and characteristic clinging to the old, yet ever absorbing the new, is apparent when we compare the old Japanese junk with the latest Japanese liner, gracefully heading out to sea, carrying great cargoes and messages of goodwill from the east to the west. messenger of modern times, bridging the Orient and the Occident, and emphatically defying the idea that East is East and West is West and never the twain shall meet. Commercially, at least, the twain have met as far as Japan is concerned. And that is the thought that we take with us as we sail away from modern Tokyo, the surprise city of the Orient. <laughs> ¶¶